Ladies and gentlemen, it is a distinct honor and a privilege for me to introduce our next keynote speaker, Dr. Mary Elke Pangestu. She is Minister of Trade, Minister of Tourism, and Creative Economy. She's the only one of two ministers in the world to actually hold that title, Creative Economy, and she'll explain a little bit more what she means about the, uh, that title means in a moment. But allow me first to say a few words of introduction about Minister Pangestu. Minister Pangestu obtained her Bachelor and Masters of Economics from the Australian National University and her PhD in Economics from the University of California, Davis, in the United States. Her fields of specialization are international trade and finance, with a regional focus on ASEAN, China, and the Asia Pacific. Until now, she is an external lecturer in international economics at the University of Indonesia, Depok. Minister Pangesu is currently a member of the advisory board of Global Competitiveness Forum, uh, which is run by the World Economic Forum, and a member of the network of Global Agenda Councils from the period of 2010 until 2011. The councils represent the world's foremost integrated intelligence network of innovative thinking and idea exchange on global issues. Prior to her assignment as the Minister of Trade in the first and second United Indonesia Cabinet, Minister Pangestu was a member of the governing board of the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Jakarta. She's also an adjunct professor at the Australia-Japan Research Center, the Australian National University, and Canberra. From 2002 until 2004, she was the co-coordinator of the Task Force on Poverty and Development for the United Nations Millennium Project, established by the UN Secretary General. In 1992, together with her colleagues, she established Yazian Sarati, a foundation that supports initiatives in the socio-cultural and environmental area. As, past, as part of her achievement, she received awards from the Australian National University Master's Scholarship from 1979 until 1980, University of California Regents Fellowships from 1983 until 1984, and from Eisenhower Exchange Fellow Individual National Program in 1990. Minister Pangestu is an active member of international seminars, including regular participants in the World Economic Forum. She's also a member of the Global Leaders for Tomorrow from 1999 until 2003. After holding her post as Minister of Trade for seven years in the first and second United Indonesian Cabinet, Minister Pangestu was appointed as Minister of Tourism and Creative Economy in October 2011. Minister Pangestu is married to Adi Hosano and has two sons, Raymond Birna and Haroso, and Ara Alexandra Harosono. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor and a pleasure to have the chance of having the minister here with us today. I believe that before she speaks, we have a special uh, musical uh, interlude uh, from also a special musician who has just arrived also from Jakarta. So I'd ask you maybe to give a brief welcome first for the musician, and then shortly thereafter, we can give a second welcome to the minister. So thank you very, very much, and we're honored to have you here, Mr. Bangasi. Thank you. sure you want to listen to me after you listen to this beautiful uh, musical instrument that was just being played but I'll try my best uh, but it is actually the right introduction uh, to the topic uh, of today which is all about the creative economy uh, and how uh, we can use creative economy uh, as really soft power or cultural diplomacy which is I think one of the uh, pillars of what ICD uh, is all about. So what you have just heard uh, is really a Western instrument, a harp is a Western instrument. Uh, Maya Hassan, one of our talented musicians, she learned in America, she went to the School of Music in America, but what she played was Indonesian songs. Uh, the first song was actually a very uh, nationalist song uh, for your country. Uh, and the second song is a folk song about how you should not uh, lose your chicken. <laughs> uh, it's a folk song, but chicken is the symbol of livelihood uh, for Indonesians. Uh, so how you should take care of your chicken and not lose it. But 
she has also composed songs uh, for the harp uh, uh, based on Indonesian uh, music. So that is actually what the creative economy is about. It's taking uh, different ideas, different technology, different uh, traditional uh, as well as creative capital and existing ones and then combining it in a creative way to create something which is uh, more value added. Uh, and today you're also uh, actually getting uh, another part of our soft diplomacy, which is the culinary uh, delights uh, of Indonesia. I hope you've also had uh, some refreshments on that front. So what is the creative economy? I, I, I like my, my new uh, job uh, when I was a trade minister. Uh, if you had listened to, uh, thank you, Mark, for your very long introduction that was kind of unnecessary. You might have wondered, uh, what is this international trade economist doing uh, talking about creative economy? Uh, when I was in the trade ministry, uh, life was quite different uh, compared to where I am now. Uh, having this new portfolio actually is a very great conversation starter because they always say, what is the creative economy? What is this portfolio uh, that you have? So uh, I'll try to explain it to you very briefly and then I hope we have uh, some time uh, for some question and answer. Uh, it is actually what people call the fourth wave uh, in uh, economic development after agrarian-based uh, development, industrialization, and the knowledge and information-based economy. Then you have the creative economy. Why is it different from knowledge and information-based economy? It's basically knowledge and information is the raw material or the input to the e creative economy. The creative economy is the ability to take knowledge, ideas, creativity that exists. Uh, it doesn't have to come up with something new, but to combine it in a creative way uh, to become something which has value added. Uh, so it is really uh, how you use your, uh, and this knowledge is embodied in the people. Uh, uh, and uh, how do you create that as value added? I'll give you uh, two examples. One is a uh, non-Indonesian example. You take the iPod. The iPod is not a new technology per se. It is taking three different technologies that already existed and then putting it together and creating an iPod. You know, someone called Steve Jobs had this great idea. He took existing technologies, he worked with it, and he came up with a new technology, combined technology, which became the iPod. That's creative economy. Uh, for Indonesia, uh, actually Maya Hassan is an example. Uh, she has learned the harp, which is a Western instrument, and then she told me uh, yesterday when people told uh, when she pe told people, "Oh, I'm from Indonesia and I play the harp," uh, and they said, "Oh, you must be you must be jobless. <laughs> uh, people wouldn't listen to the harp in Indonesia. That's uh, totally wrong because once you uh, create the harp, which is a Western instrument, and you play Indonesian songs in the beautiful way she did." you've created something different, something new, with value added, which in the end uh, is very much appreciated and has very, very high value in Indonesia. There are many examples like that. I'm just giving you an example to, to put in your mind what is really creative economy and what is creative industries. And creativity is not just artisti artistic based, but also based on science, engineering, innovation, and IT based. I don't know whether you can see the rather small PowerPoint up there, but uh, I like this picture because uh, IT, uh, creative industry is not just the dancers, the performing arts, the contemporary arts that you see, but it's also that geeky looking guy at the bottom there who's uh, doing uh, gr uh, maybe video games uh, or animation or creating the mobile platforms uh, that we all use. Uh, and uh, let's compare the uh, workers in the uh, second wave, which is industrialization. The workers in the factories that are that is in the first picture coming out of the factory, they don't look very happy, right? Because uh, every day what they're doing is in the factory, do, using uh, routine uh, work every day, doing the same thing. Whereas if you look at the uh, workers in the creative industries, they're all smiling <laughs> because they're enjoying uh, what they're doing. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, very much part of the, the creative industries. Um, uh, why is Indonesia, uh, why is our government, uh, as, as a government, decided to uh, promote the creative industries? Because uh, Indonesia is a very, very rich uh, country in terms of the knowledge base and the cultural heritage that it has to build 
uh, creative economy and creative industries, uh, including a very large domestic market. I don't know how, how much all of you know about Indonesia, but Indonesia is a very large country. We have 17,000 islands, uh, we have, um, out of which 6,000 are inhabited. We have 240 million people with 300 ethnic tribes, 742 language uh, and dialects. Uh, we have more water than we have land. <laughs> it's a very marine-based uh, country. Uh, eight of the world cultural heritage sites are uh, in Indonesia. Um, and we stretch over 3,000 kilometers, these 3,000 uh, islands. Unfortunately, Bali is a bit blocked here, but Bali is only one island uh, out of the uh, 6,000 6, islands that are inhabited. We have many, many islands and many, many places in Indonesia, each with their unique cultural uh, heritage. And this is really the basic raw material uh, for uh, the creative industries. In the World Competitiveness Index for Tourism, we are ranked number 39 uh, for cultural uh, heritage and strong creative uh, industries out of 139 uh, countries. Uh, what are creative industries? Many countries define it different, differently. Some countries call them culture industries or copyright industries. Uh, one of the countries which is quite advanced in uh, developing creative industries is the UK uh, and Korea. And we have uh, somewhat followed uh, their example, they, uh, especially the UK. The only, the only other, uh, other country which has a ministry of creative tourism is a creative economy is uh, the UK. Uh, we've adopted this very broad definition uh, to include advertising, architecture, art and, and art galleries and antique market, handicraft, design, fashion, film, video and photography, interactive games, music, performing arts, publication and printing, uh, computer and service software, radio and television, research and development, and culinary arts. These are the 15 uh, subsectors which we have uh, classified as creative industries uh, in Indonesia. Other countries have defined it uh, differently. Uh, and uh, we, we are, uh, some of them are in a better uh, prog uh, development than others, but this is our whole uh, gamut. These are some of the faces of our creative um, industries. And they're all, what's disting distinctive about them? They're all mainly young. <laughs> because 50% of Indonesians are below 29 years old. So we have a large stock of creative young people, as well as they are also the market uh, for us. This is the demographic structure of Indonesia, with 50% uh, uh, below 29, and 40% in the productive population of 15 to 45. Really the market and the creative uh, human resources, because the main input to a creative uh, economy is uh, your human resources. The other th exciting thing about Indonesia, um, which is happening worldwide, but uh, for some reason, it's in Indonesia, it's like uh, a huge, exponential development, especially in the last uh, two or three years. Uh, despite uh, being a very large country and stretching across uh, uh, 3,000 kilometer, Indonesians are very interconnected uh, through uh, the fact that they are all uh, connecting through the uh, mobile phone. So Indonesia has a low internet penetration rate when you talk about directly through the fixed line and the computer but they are very connected through the mobile uh, platform. We have 250 million cell phone subscribers, so it's more than 100% uh, penetration rate. We are the second largest Facebook user in the world after the US, 42.8 million people. The third largest Twitter user at slightly over 7 million. Um, I don't know how, how many of you are Twitter users, but we are often in the trending topic sometimes for the right reason, but hopefully uh, most of the time for the right reasons. And how do you explain, um, you know, uh, and YouTube also uh, is one of the things that happens a lot in Indonesia. Largest growth in Blackberry and smartphone use. Again, it's the demographics, it's the cl culture of uh, ngurumpi. Ngurumpi is a very local Indonesian word, but Indonesians just like to hang around in coffee shops or uh, anywhere and, and talk and chat. 
And so the social media, uh, that's my own explanation without having done the uh, actual anthropo anthropological or sociological study of why social media has taken off in Indonesia. And I think the other reason is because we are a democracy. Uh, we have freedom of expression. We have been uh, a full democracy since 1999. We had the first directly elected president in 2004. We have direct elections all the way down uh, to the village head. Uh, and also the sharp decline in the cost of the devices as well as uh, cost of connectivity. Uh, so, you know, freedom of, uh, as, as I always tell people, Indonesia has become a normal country. We have a very noisy parliament, we have a very noisy media who won't let any of us as government officials get away with anything. Uh, and uh, the moment you say something, it goes viral, <laughs> you know, on the Twitter, or, you know, it's lots of discussion uh, on the Twitter. So uh, uh, we have uh, really uh, this exponential growth in uh, connectivity, which is really uh, transforming the way you do business. Uh, transforming the way uh, people communicate socially. It transformed uh, all politicians if they haven't really figured out well, how to use the social media, you know, they're like behind the times. Uh, so uh, we use it uh, also at to, uh, for policy platforms. So uh, it's, it's really a, a big revolution in Indonesia and that's part of the creative economy uh, because a lot of the content that goes in there or the way you do business uh, is, is a part of the uh, content that goes in there. Uh, and most of the social net networking sites are experiencing uh, lapsed users. So if you use Facebook, you're also using YouTube, you're also using Twitter. Uh, and uh, lots of active users uh, in, uh, in uh, social networking. Um, why is the creative economy important? There are six reasons. And as the economist, I will uh, begin with the economic reason. Uh, and this is important uh, because of the economic contribution. And it is the way I, ca I can get my budget from the Minister of Finance <laughs> to explain why this is important, and why you should uh, give us a, a, a big enough budget. It's 7% of the GDP, it's 10% of exports, uh, and it is 7% of employment. Uh, and let me see, uh, for the world, uh, the U.S. creative economy contributes 11% to the U.S. economy uh, and contributes 8.5% to its uh, employment. I'm trying to find Germany in here. There's, I can't find Germany here, but let's take uh, ne Netherlands for an example. 5.9% uh, contribution to GDP and 8.8% to uh, employment creation. So, you know, Hollywood in America, that's creative economy, and all the Silicon Valley uh, IT-based uh, industries, Steve Jobs, uh, Bill Gates, they're all uh, really part of the creative economy, and we know what that's done uh, for the US. Uh, the second reason why creative economy is important is nation branding and identity. And this is really where I think cultural diplomacy, soft power uh, is very important. Uh, if you talk about nation branding, uh, people talk about uh, how uh, nation branding is created through tourism, exports, government, investment, immigration, culture and cultural heritage, and the people. And Indonesia's rich and cu diverse culture diversity is really the source of its nation branding and identity, and really a source. Once you have uh, uh, icons in your creative economy, it makes you proud to be uh, uh, from that country. You know, uh, if you take, okay, Americans should be proud that they have Bill Gates, they have Steve Jobs, they have Mike, uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, the, the Brits are proud uh, to have, um, uh, to have uh, the Beatles, you know. Uh, what, what's, a, what's a good German uh, example? Uh, give me a good German example of, of a creative economy icon. Anybody? I ha I'm, I'm huh? Yes, football player, yes. Even sport, in some countries include sports uh, as part of the creative economy. Uh, so the, look at the uh, soft power and cultural diplomacy that has hit in a big way in Asia and is about to penetrate Europe and uh, US. It's the K-pop. Have you all heard of K-pop? Uh, Korean pop. Ha they call it Hallyu. It's the Korean wave, and it's incredible. It's really just uh, a very well-trained groups of young girls who sing uh, 
with synchronized dancing. Uh, and it's a big, big wave in Asia. And I was told they are now having some kind of competition in New York uh, for a, a K-pop competition. And uh, it, you don't even know the lyrics that you are singing. It's in Korean. But <laughs> you should see it in it, how much of a big wave it's had on Indonesia and how much it's raised Korea uh, as, 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 as a country. Yeah? I'm just giving you examples. So nation branding and identity and the use of culture. I think it's, it's not new, but we, we are seeing it uh, now formulated in many ways. The, the power of music and film uh, as creative industries on, on the way a country uh, gets elevated uh, and seen uh, in the outside world is, is quite incredible. It can be a film that's uh, shot on location in your country, like James Bond movie to <laughs> Bangkok, uh, or um, a Petronas Power because Matrix was shot there. Uh, or uh, my favorite example is actually The Sound of Music. 40 years after The Sound of Music was filmed, Austria is still getting tourists because of the sound of music. You know, that, that's how powerful um, uh, this can be. A third reason is that creative economy or creative industries uh, are using renewable resources. It's very environmentally uh, sustainable because it is based on knowledge, ideas, and innovation. The main input is, are the people, the innovative and creative people. Uh, and, and we have seen quite an interesting development in Indonesia. I'm giving you an example here. If you take a piece of wood, a log, a piece of log, it becomes firewood. It takes you two hours to chop it into firewood, and it's worth 60 cents. But the moment that piece of log is used to make wooden staplers, you can get 200 pieces of wooden staplers crafted by, uh, by handmade, by handy uh, craftsmen. It takes them 40 work days and it's worth $1,000. You can ask the question, you as the craftsman and the village uh, people who are working and getting income from this, are you going to take care of the log? Yes, because it is your livelihood and it is your input. And that's really the best way to have sustainability. And we found uh, a big wave since supermarkets got rid of uh, plastic bags and uh, uh, paper bags even to carry your supermarket goods. Uh, we are seeing a big wave of the use of waste product, like the back of toothpaste, uh, the billboards that you see on the roadside, what happens to them after they're no longer used? You can turn them into bags, you can turn them into laptop uh, uh, bags, uh, phone bags, uh, backpacks. This is created what we what I've called the green creative industries uh, in Indonesia, and I've seen also sculptures being made from uh, disposable Coke and Seven Up cans, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's the fourth reason is uh, it creates value added from innovation, uh, and and it's low investment and high return. Uh, Take batik, which is a traditional uh, method of making cloth in Indonesia. I'm looking around, anybody wearing batik here? Uh, today we are not wearing batik. I'm not wearing batik, I'm wearing something from uh, north eastern uh, no, to, uh, uh, Nusa Tenggara. Batik is cloth, you make the pattern by hand, you put wax and then you color it. That's really the basic method. But we, with the revolution of batik for young people and creative economy, Batik is now put on denim, it's put on, uh, mixed together with uh, other types of material so that young people will wear it. Once you have young people wear it, then you've got a huge market. Normally, we used to wear batik only for formal e occasions. Low investment and high return. This is data from Korea. Korea is one of the more, more advanced countries in uh, creating a creative economy. An average Korean company in creative economy puts about 400 million won, which is about US 429,000, to develop new technology, and about 20 million won, or US 20,000, for designing projects. And the maximum return, assuming your product takes off, of course, is nine months. So it's low investment, but the moment you, you, can, you get a hit, uh, and this is a whole process of incubation, startup capital, how you develop uh, entrepreneurship, you can get your return in nine months. Um, for your information, how did Bill Gates start? Bill Gates started Microsoft with $25,000, which he didn't get from his parents, even though his parents were quite rich, but we're f he got it from a startup uh, fund. Uh, that startup fund uh, made a very good 
investment in Bill Gates. And that's how uh, micro Microsoft started. Uh, what's another good example? Um, Richard Branson. Richard Branson, who started Virgin Air, how did he start? He started out with uh, $50,000 to convert. Uh, he started out in the music industry, if you remember, from his mother. <laughs> Uh, so startup capital can be formal companies. It can not, in, in Asia, normally it comes from your parents or from your friends. So this is the kind of uh, thing that happens. The f final uh, benefit of creative economy, creative industries, is, is that it has a positive social impact. It's quality of life and improving social tolerance. People who work in the creative industries are happy because they are doing it with their heart, with their minds. And it develops social tolerance across different cultures, ethnicity, religion, and age. If you take Indonesia for an ex as an example, the fact that each region now, the, the Batik Revolution, which has happened in the last seven years, has created every region now has their own Batik. And they will wear it proudly. And even government offices, nationally and regionally, they have now made it that every Friday, in, every Tuesday and Friday, we wear a national uh, cloth. Yeah, it can be uh, from your region, it can be outside of your region. Um, and it helps understanding between country, uh, between regions, say in Indonesia. And if you talk about between countries, this is where culture diplomacy comes in. Uh, take the K-pop as a start. K-pop is just an entry point. Uh, K-pop, oh, everybody likes it, but as soon as you, uh, 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 that as an entry point, you wanna know more about Korea about its culture, about its people, about etc. So it's just an entry point, just like film and music does the same thing. Uh, so I think that's um, the main uh, reasons why we have creative economy. And uh, let me just close with uh, what are the challenges? Uh, there, there's a very long presentation here which I will give to you uh, and you can post on your website with all the numbers. I'll just close with the challenges for creative economy in Indonesia. I, we have six challenges that we have identified. One is the uh, human resources, because the main input are the, are the people. How can you develop uh, people who, who will have the creative mindset? This is part of the curriculum that you have to have, the, kind, the, the way you teach uh, kids from very young uh, to be creative in schools and institutions. Uh, and uh, what has been a, 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 an important challenge is maintaining and developing the traditional institutions that exist. You know, you take cities outside of Jakarta. If you go outside of Jakarta to the smaller cities, it, it still happens today. From very young in Indonesia, uh, it, it happens in many other countries, but in Indonesia, as an example, from very young, children are taught to dance, to sing, uh, to do the cultural activities which are related to their particular uh, locality, and we have to maintain that. And they're no normally done in the community uh, center or the, commun or, or the village center. So we are putting a lot of attention as to how we can maintain that. Take a city like Solo. They have 500 um, dance, uh, dance community centers, uh, each specializing in different dances, you know, and that's what we have to maintain. Or you take children in Bali. If you're a, children, a child in Bali, if you're a girl, you have to start dancing at the age of five. And they will do all this, you know, the, the very uh, specific Balinese movement, which is something which is taught from five years old. If you're a boy, you have to play the gamelan, the Bali gamelan music. And that's part of your uh, growing up, it's, it's your la lifestyle. And that's why we have such a rich uh, resource in terms of the people. Second, the business climate uh, for uh, creating uh, creative printers to be able to grow uh, from a good idea, uh, to have financing, to have the good um, business plan. They have to be protected on their IPR. Uh, how can a very micro enterprise with no track record uh, become a viable business? Tax and customs issue, etc. Three, how do you have appreciation for creative products and services in Indonesia? How do you prevent somebody from having a good idea and then creating a product and then somebody else just copies it? And then that's it, you know, they can't, they won't be able to, uh, get it. so how do you have, uh, create the appreciation? Fourth, internet uh, penetration, accessibility to IT and other technologies, uh, supporting infra infrastructure, including public space for the creative industries to grow. For developed countries like Germany, you take this for granted. But believe me, for us, uh, it is a, a, a big challenge, and this is going to be one of my uh, big challenges. 
how do you create community areas? How do you have galleries, museums, theaters, and retail space and creative zones in cities? I mean, I, 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 this is my first time in uh, ITB Berlin, and when I look at your convention center and your congress center and uh, the museums and the, and the uh, opera houses you hear, I just, I'm just so amazed, you know, um, and of course very, very envious that you have this infrastructure, which was created, I understand, in the 70s. Uh, it's just incredible, you know, this is the kind of thing uh, we need to begin to develop uh, in countries like Indonesia. The fifth, uh, access to resources and inputs. The sixth, funding issue. This is always the big thing, uh, not every, most of the creative printers do not have access to the banks, and they won't because banks have no idea how to put uh, a value uh, on ideas, on, on, on creativity. Uh, it's not a collateral that they can deal with. It's, they have to appraise it, you know, how do you appraise uh, a good idea for a film? So you need to have that bridging uh, phase, whether it's a startup capital, venture capital, or uh, like countries like Korea or many other countries, they have what they call arts endowment where uh, they will provide uh, seed capital uh, to uh, some of the uh, new uh, creative um, printers that are there. So these are the things that we are, uh, this is a new ministry, it's been only around for four months, but these are some of the issues, policy issues, institutional issues, human resource issues that we are uh, dealing with. Uh, but uh, we believe that uh, this is a uh, very uh, strong competitive and comparative advantage for Indonesia, given our uh, demographic structure, our cultural heritage, uh, the fact that Indonesia is a democracy, freedom of expression. Uh, these are all strengths uh, that we need to unleash and develop to become uh, a strong creative economy, which can be a very, very powerful tool for cultural diplomacy, soft power, uh, and to raise the whole uh, image of Indonesia in the world. Because we, we do recognize that uh, there is lack of knowledge and understanding about Indonesia in general. Uh, and, and, and creative economy and cultural diplom diplomacy is going to be a very powerful way to do it. Uh, I'd like to thank you for giving me the time to uh, uh, share with you my thoughts and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you.